Hey, it's Justin Harvey. Thanks for tuning in to the Anesthesia and Pain Management Success Podcast. With APM Success, we take a close look at important topics pertaining to business, practice management, personal finance, and careers for anesthesiologists and pain management physicians. We work hard to take your critical questions straight to the experts. Thanks for listening. Welcome to another episode of APM Success. This week, I am re-releasing a podcast episode that has been shared on the Pain Unfiltered podcast uh, with my friends, Dr. Patrick Buchanan and Dawood Sayed. So I encourage you to check out that podcast and this conversation recently aired over there. Check it out, Pain Unfiltered. Thanks for listening this week. Hello and welcome to Pain Unfiltered, where we go in-depth into the interventional pain and spine world with some of the top key opinion leaders and executives in the space. We are your hosts, Dr. Patrick Buchanan and Dr. Timothy Deer for this Aspen podcast. Let's get started. Welcome to episode six of the Pain Unfiltered podcast. I am Dr. Patrick Buchanan and with me back again to pinch hit is my guest host, Dr. Dawood Syed. Dawood, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Patrick. Thanks for having me back on. Always uh, happy to jump on when uh, Dr. Deer's uh, a little busy, which is a lot of the time. Absolutely. Yeah, he's definitely got a busy schedule. It seems like he's in a different country every week. But um, before we start, we'd like to announce our third sponsor for season one, Spinal Simplicity. Their device, Miniman, is an outpatient, minimally invasive spine fusion therapy that decreases recovery time and can alleviate pain for patients with chronic back and leg pain. David, what are your thoughts on Spinal Simplicity and their partnership with our podcast? Yeah, I think it's been really exciting to see the uh, our industry sponsors uh, line up really to kind of help support this podcast and and get some of the messaging messaging out. And uh, Spinal Simplicity is a company that I know very well. Their uh, uh, owner and founder lives probably less than a mile away from my house, so it's a local Kansas City company. Uh, someone I consider a good friend, Todd Mosley, is uh, the founder of that company. And the device, Minuteman, was developed by a neurosurgeon here in Kansas City. So it's something that I've seen, their interesting journey, how it was you know, primarily a device uh, targeting you know, neurosurgeons and orthopedic spine surgeons. But over time, uh, as the field of interventional pain and spine has evolved, uh, you see that you know, a lot of their users are actually interventionalists uh, because of the profile of the procedure and the gap. Uh, in the algorithm that it fits. So it's something that I use in my practice. And I know a lot of folks that are probably going to listen, use it as well. And it's really helped us uh, help a lot of patients. So uh, kudos to them for sponsoring us and really like the work that they're doing there. Uh, And always, uh, I'm a little biased towards Kansas City companies because there's not too many of them in the interventional pain space. Yeah, another great company that's, you know, doing it right, investing in education and research and really trying to take the interventional spine pace uh, to another level. Uh, We'd also like to thank our other season sponsors, Mainstay Medical and Vertos Medical. Thank you for supporting honest and unfiltered conversations. So, Dawood, ever since medical school and even undergrad, you know, we've always had to evaluate the next step in our training. From doing well in the SATs to get into a really good med school or doing well on the boards to get into a really good residency and so on. Each step of our training kind of prepared us for the next chapter in our life. But who trained us our careers after fellowship and residency? You know, who taught us how to read an employment contract or how to evaluate a surgery center investment? You know, we lacked kind of the business aspect of medicine. Well, our guest speaker today has quite a bit of experience in this field, the business side of medicine. Let's introduce our guest, Justin Harvey, founder of AP Wealth. Thanks for joining us, Justin. Thank you, Drs. Buchanan and Sayed. It's a pleasure to be here today. So Justin, why don't you just briefly talk about your background and your training? Yeah, so I am a uh, a wealth advisor for pain management physicians as well as anesthesiologists. The name of my firm, APM Wealth, alludes to this anesthesia and pain management. And uh, my wife, Sarah, is an anesthesiologist in private practice out here in Portland. And about six years ago, when I was uh, in what we'll call a career pivot, thinking about my next move. I was uh, getting to know this young lady who at the time was uh, just my girlfriend and many of her resident peers as well. And as we were talking about the career of anesthesiology and the the cousin pain management that I at the time, I didn't really understand how that worked, but 70% of pain management physicians are anesthesia boarded. I, uh, I discovered that doctors, you know, this is no surprise to this audience. They're so 
intently focused on clinical excellence, that there's not a lot of time for the business, practice management, and sort of functional out there in the real world context of career questions that every single one of those doctors is going to face. So I launched APM Wealth with the thesis of this specialty specific approach to building wealth. Uh, I wasn't really aware of anything like that out there. And I thought, you know, if you're starting something from the beginning, you don't have to rip anything down to make it work. You just start and see what happens. And it's been uh, an awesome journey that has been really successful and really fun. That's great, Justin. Kind of walk us through how you partnered with Aspen or how you even found us and kind of why you started, uh, started to support us. Yeah. So at the outset, I was looking at many of the different societies and going to the meetings. And I was this like insecure young financial advisor showing up at a place where I didn't belong and where I was the you know, we have a reputation in among physicians and many times it's well earned of the the slimy kind of used car salesman type. And so I was uh, bearing that in mind <laughs> and very, uh, you know, had this imposter syndrome. But I found actually a number of physicians to be incredibly welcoming. And the Aspen community in particular was very collaborative, very forward thinking. It unified disciplines and even industries. And I found among the Aspen cohort, a lot of like-minded people, both physicians and non, other industry partners. And as I was trying to figure out where am I going to really invest relationally to get to know people and to share the intellectual capital that I was building, Aspen seemed like a really natural fit. So I'm excited to partner with Aspen. I really enjoyed the last few Aspen meetings and I look forward to them every year. Yeah, that's great, Justin. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, I've uh, really enjoyed kind of, you know, interacting with you. And I know when we were just kind of forming the society, you were uh, involved in some of the webinars and things we did. So it's always, uh, always interesting to see how these relationships can develop and actually seeing how you've developed. So, you know, I think, you know, I've, you know, trained a lot of residents and fellows, um, and they always kind of, you know, once they get towards the end of their training and they're going to start getting, you know, quote unquote, that first real job, they start asking questions, you know, like, you know, should I get a financial plan or when is it, when's the right time? So what's kind of your advice to these folks that are kind of entering that, you know, first phase of actually having a career? When do you really kind of start thinking about these things? Great question. There's a couple different phases of the physician's career where there's unique needs. So during training, there's a couple important things. You want to make sure your student loans, you get a plan for those, get disability insurance, make sure you're not going into credit card debt, some of the basics. And then once you get into starting to vet attending contracts, I do think that's when you want to begin thinking about building a professional team. Now, whether or not that means you need a financial advisor, uh, you know, some physicians are sort of wired to be do-it-yourselfers. They're self-starting, reading White Coat Investor every weekend, and they are they know how to put together an asset allocation. Those people, they probably don't need an advisor. There are many others who uh, don't, they're not exactly energized by the thought of doing those things, and they want to partner with an expert. And I tell people when I'm talking to physicians in training, right around the time you start looking at employment contracts for that first attending job, it's a perfect time to reach out to me because what I find is that decision... And this is where there's a ton of value in the model that I have espoused in my my firm. The, the time when you're looking at those initial contracts, there's so much economic value bound up in that contract. If you sign a bad contract or you get in a practice that has a compensation structure that doesn't align with your goals, if you're more, I want to, you know, <laughs> sky's the limit, go, 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 let's see production. And you're in a capped model that is a salary with a quality bonus. And you don't really discern these things or you don't understand the pay per RVU, even if you like the RVUs, but... You know it's production, but you don't really know if it's, is it fair compensation. That's a, easily a six-figure mistake if you do it wrongly. And it's there's I can tell you as a financial advisor, there's not a lot of opportunities where I can immediately add six figures of value for someone, but contracts, it happens not infrequently. So I'm eager to engage with my clients around the contract discussion and help them understand the practice models, help them understand alignment of compensation. What does it mean if you're on RVUs versus percent of collections and what's the difference? And maybe you're actually more wired to want a salary with a quality bonus or a department bonus or something like that, because you're not, uh, you know, that's just a better fit for your personality and your professional goals. That's totally legitimate. It's just a question of knowing what you're looking for and then making sure that that role as best as you can tell, because it obviously is an act of faith and you do learn through experience. But if you can shorten the learning curve a little bit, if I can help my clients avoid a couple of those landmines, that's a very uh, exciting and rewarding part of my job for sure. So Justin, let's dive a little deeper in the employment agreement contracts. You know, what 
points are you looking for specifically in these employment agreements? So uh, a number of things I would say to somebody who's just beginning this journey or thinking about employment agreements, everything is negotiable. The profile of the practice with whom you're negotiating will give you some insight as to the degree. And obviously, the, the bigger the company, the bigger the firm, if it's a, a major like regional or national group, in general, those contracts are going to be less fungible because they've got a legal department, and a bunch of lawyers that you have to argue with. And that's, in general, a little harder to do than a, a two physician practice who's bringing you on as an associate. But I've seen the biggest and the beefiest <laughs> institutions, especially in the last couple of years, because physicians of all specialties are very in demand, they have acquiesced on things that historically they never have. So I would encourage any listeners, don't assume that just because it's a big group, you're not going to get a signing bonus and you shouldn't ask for one. You always should ask. Uh, and then you want to think through, if you're looking at an employment agreement and understanding the implications of it, how does this look for me in three to five years? Uh, what are my goals for income and how am I going to get there based on the compensation structure? And what is the business participation that this agreement allows for. So one of the great things about pain management is it allows you to participate in the business of medicine much more so than many other specialties. Some specialties, it's totally excluded. And there are some pain contracts where it's totally excluded, but you don't have to necessarily sign one of those if you don't want to. There's intellectual property, there's consulting with industry, there's surgery centers and other ancillaries. There's a lot of opportunities to um, be able to monetize your very hard earned medical degree and specialty specific training. And if you don't do that in the employment agreement, if you sign all those things away, then it's too bad. So sad for you. You've got to negotiate it up front if you want to be able to do any of these things. So thinking specifically about business participation and, you know, the, the easiest example is a surgery center and a surgery center buy-in. And we can talk more about that, but, um, uh, understanding, looking ahead and saying for the doctors who have been here three, four, six years or longer, what is their, the composition of their business participation? Because that's the sort of the beta model for where you're going to be going unless you do something very different or push for something different. And if that's what you want, great. And if that's not what you want, if you're locked out of a lot of that business participation, there's a, that can be a significant wealth driver for physicians, if you're participating in the business and the business is profitable and you're treating patients ethically and your reputation grows favorably and you're making more money over time from doing that, then you own a valuable enterprise. And eventually you can sell that thing for a lot of money. If you're just only ever a W-2 employee and you're never per permitted to participate in the practice or the surgery center or any ancillaries, you're never permitted to consult and or any of those things, then you better hope that you can save a lot of money from just your W-2 wages and that can be done because pain management physicians can still earn a good wage, obviously, but uh, it's not the most efficient way to monetize your clinical efforts. So a little forethought goes a long way. Hey, Justin, you know, uh, I can't remember the stat, but this is when I was kind of graduating from fellowship and I, I heard it regurgitated quite a few times that, you know, maybe it's, I don't, the number might be wrong, more than 50% or 75% of fellows first jobs, they end up leaving, you know, so uh, on that tune, and you might know that stat more better than I do. What are some of the red flags that, you know, folks should be looking at when they look at a contract, like when you've seen these in the past, like those are kind of things that have ended with these separations. Yeah. Two things come immediately to mind. Uh, the first is if it's a production model, meaning if you're getting paid per RVU or on a percent of collections, you need to understand how you're going to get busy as a physician. It's one thing to say, you know, especially in a smaller group where there's a doctor or two and they're running at 110% of capacity and they're thinking, oh my gosh, we're so busy. We need help. They hire you. They give you their 10 or 15% excess. Great for them because they're still busy, but you have 15% of your capacity utilized and you now need to figure out where the other 85% is going to come from. So if you either don't have a guarantee period, meaning a $300,000 base for 12 or 18 or 24 months to make sure that you get through that period, um, or if it's not a long enough duration, then you're going to hit that cliff where after 12 months you drop off, you've never had the time to establish the referral relationships that you need to be able to sort of increase, increase clinical throughput. And you are stuck uh, you know, maybe with a great percent of like <laughs> there, are, I've seen cases where physicians will pick a practice because it's, it's a great percent of collections, but the throughput is so low because they can't get busy and they didn't realize that there was no marketing or other support infrastructure to assist that physician to have a sufficient patient volume to make a good income that it can be significantly detrimental. And they find themselves basically, uh, it's almost like they're starting a practice, <laughs> but with no equity. 
So they have W-2 wages, but they need to build their own patient base. And sometimes they realize, dang, if I would have known this from the beginning, I would have just hung out my own shingle because I'm doing all the hardest work of creating those uh, that network of getting building the patient base. So that's one thing that I would say is if you're on production, understand what kind of support are you going to get and what kind of precedent is there. If you're a second or third or fourth person in this role and others have been hired into it and have progressed through it, make sure you understand like what happened to those. Did they quit, get pissed off and realize they couldn't get enough volume and leave town? Or did they become partners and buy into the surgery center and attain success in the way that you hope to? That tell, Again, that's sort of the beta model for where you're going to go assuming that there's no other variables interacting with the situation. So that's one thing I would say uh, is understand how to get busy in a production model. Greetings, listeners. We interrupt this regularly scheduled broadcast to let you know about an upcoming webinar. 8 p.m. Eastern Standard. On Thursday, October 19th, I'm hosting a webinar for physicians who are transitioning out of clinical practice. So if you're within five years of selling your practice, bringing on an associate on an ownership track, or in other ways, meaningfully monetizing an existing office-based practice and or a surgery center, this webinar is designed for you. I'll be talking about important operational, financial, and tax planning considerations for transitioning practice owners. It's never too soon to start thinking about these things, but this content is designed for physicians within five years of transition. You can register for this webinar at apmsuccess.com slash webinar, or check out the link in this week's show notes. Hope to see you on October 19th. The second thing that I would say is understand the terms of severing. And I would always, this is a good time to say like, I'm not a lawyer. None of this is legal advice. So don't listen to anything I say. Definitely hire an attorney who is admitted to the bar in your state to give you contract specific advice. I will say, however, that I tend to look at contracts very differently than your average employment, uh, law attorney, because I get the practice dynamics and understand the compensation structures and pain management a little differently. So our perspectives tend to be complementary. But you want to make sure that the terms of the non-compete, the terms of who's going to pay for MedMal, if there's a tail premium due, if you're on a a claims made policy and there's going to be a a tail due, you want to make sure you know who's going to pay it because that can be a really big five-figure number And if you (laughs) took a job, it didn't work out, you never made enough money, you quit because you're pissed off, and then you get an invoice in the mail for $44,000 for your tail premium, that's really going to ruin your day. So understanding those um, terms around severing and really having uh, having an employment lawyer explain it to you, a lot of the battle is just understanding expectations. If you know that's going to happen, it might be annoying, but if you agreed to it on the front end, then you can prepare for it. It's when you get surprised by these things, when you get surprised that, oh man, it's 15 miles from every site I've worked at in the last 12 months, not just the one I work at now. And it creates this constellation of sites and the radius is gigantic and you have to leave the county in order to continue to practice. That is terrible. And you should, frankly, I think it's pretty unethical too. It's a structure of employment agreements in that way, but that's a separate uh, conversation. But you need to get an attorney to explain this to you on the front end to make sure that you know what's coming. Thanks, Justin. Uh, those are some great points. Th- this show is also not financial advice, but what are some of the ways uh, physicians can kind of build wealth over time? Um, the first thing I would say is you got to put your blinders on <laughs> um, because you're going to become an attending and all everybody in your fellowship cohort is too. And wealth means different things to every one of your other seven fellow peers if you're in a cohort of eight. And you could all be living your best wealthy life and have very different definitions of what that means. So don't assume that it means merely economic remuneration for your clinical efforts. Although often that's part of it because money gives you autonomy, gives you freedom and allows you to decouple from the day-to-day grind. But it's often a lot more than that. Sometimes it's flexibility and family and travel and being able to have time for hobbies. And maybe it's even having an employment arrangement that is structured to give you freedom within your specialty to collaborate with other clinicians, with uh, industry partners, to do the business participation kinds of things that I mentioned. So wealth is something worth thinking about. Like, what does this mean to you? And how do I find a job that not just is going to yield me the highest annual compensation, but is going to give me a holistic satisfaction based on all the things that are important to me. And if I'm married and have a family, everyone, all the stakeholders in that decision. Um, as I mentioned, business participation is a an important driver. Uh, I Surgery center participation, owning a practice. When you own a business, no matter what kind of business it is, if it's profitable, somebody's willing to pay you 
the, the way that we express it most commonly is a multiple of the profit, also known as EBITDA, E-B-I-T-D-A is the acronym. Um, it just means the profit that's left over after you pay all your expenses. And if you want to have access to that business participation and have the upside leverage that that creates, when you buy into a profitable surgery center, for example, there's two ways that you get paid from the surgery center. One is the profit distributions every month and every quarter from the collective efforts of all the partner physicians. You pay all the bills and then the distributions of the profits go to the shareholders in accordance of your uh, percentage ownership. So if you own 11% of the ASC every quarter, 11% of the profits get distributed to you. Um, That's one way that you get paid. The second way that you get paid is as you continue to build momentum for this organization as it becomes more and more reputable in the community, as you bring in new partners and new or build a broader referral network, and it becomes more and more profitable over time. Ultimately, you can sell that 11%. And one of the common ways that this functions over time is you're, uh, you sell a, a part of it. So if you're a, a founding physician in a de novo surgery center, you get your 11% on day one, you build it, build it, build it, it becomes very profitable, and you take something that you paid $100,000 for. And now the stake is worth millions, a a couple million, a few million or or more, depending on how big and successful it becomes. And a a common way for this to unfold would be a big operator, uh, a national company that's used to running surgery centers says, hey, we can come in, we can improve your contracts, we can streamline your staffing, we can take over a lot of these things that you're not really good at and don't want to do. And we're going to buy a part of your share. Maybe we'll buy 50% of your stake. So you go from 11% to 5.5% of the overall stake. And then the whoever the national group is, they'll own half of the surgery center, or maybe it's 51% because they want control. And then if all goes as planned, your distributions drop off maybe a little bit, but maybe not that much because if the contracts all got better, if the efficiency really did happen, if the staffing did get smoothed out, um, you're continuing to get a pretty good distribution and you got this big windfall of 50% of your ownership stake. And so that is a huge one-time event that can be really, really profitable. And it's the the result of planning ahead in the beginning, identifying an opportunity, and then really investing your time and effort over years, and then being rewarded at the end of the line. So in terms of wealth building, understanding the business participation component in pain management is really important for physicians that want to fast track their journey. And it is possible. I would also, here's the counterpoint to that. The surgery center participation is kind of the shiny object, especially for young doctors. And they, they see that as like, as soon as you come in on day one, I want to ask about a surgery center. And that's great. But the fact is a surgery center is just a business and there's good businesses, good businesses and bad businesses, ones that are very profitable, ones that are not profitable and ones that lose a ton of money. And it's possible to buy into a surgery center that doesn't distribute profits, that loses money, that has capital calls. A capital call is when we're about to start bouncing checks as a business and we're, we reach out to all the shareholders and say, y'all need to write us a check uh, or else we're going to you know, go under, go out of business or whatever. So there's a lot of those out there too. And if there's issues with volume we, uh, or maybe the reimbursement per case or per contract is not looking very good with one of the big payers, whatever. There's there's challenges there. So it's not monolithic. Like surgery center is good. It can be a good wealth multiplier, but you need to vet every opportunity based on its merits and they're both good and bad. Yeah, that's really good insight, Justin. Uh, besides the surgery center, you know, what other, you know, common ancillary revenue streams have you seen physicians kind of participate in, you know, both ethically and, you know, within the, within the law and successfully? Yeah, there's a couple, um, a couple really sort of common ones that are pretty accessible would be medical legal. So like expert witnessing, doing depositions, giving a legal opinion on a case where there's, you know, you're talking to lawyers about uh, a, a patient's treatment and talking about was the standard of care, yes or no. And then you have an agreed upon hourly rate for those efforts. And then you're for those efforts, you're self-employed. So even if you're a W-2 employee at a practice, as long as your employment agreement allows for deposition work, you're also a business owner because you can do this medical legal, you can earn consulting fees, and then that pot of money. And this sort of relates to the last question as well about ways to build wealth as a pain physician. If you can get this self-employment income, it opens up all these new avenues, not only because you're making more money to pay off debt, invest, buy rental real estate, open a new line of service in your practice or whatever, um, 
but uh, you can actually do interesting things with self-employment retirement plans. For example, an indep- uh, a solo 401k or an individual 401k is a, a one-person 401k plan that even if you're an employee at uh, XYZ Incorporated Pain Practice, if you've got 50 or 75 grand of um, consulting, medical, legal, industry collaboration, doing workshops on the weekends, types of income, you can contribute a meaningful part of that pre-tax into a solo 401k. And so you can have an even bigger bucket in which you can put your uh, tax deferred savings. Um, other answers. So there's other clinical ancillaries and I don't really want to get into it because you quickly get into like stark and anti-kickback territory and it depends on the state and depends on the multi versus single specialty and lots of other variables. Uh, but there are a number of services that physicians provide to their patients, whether it's imaging, UDS, um, PT, DME, all of those. I've seen some practices where doctors own like six different companies and they do all of those things. And I've heard other people say that that's illegal. I can't opine. I don't know if it is or not. Again, maybe it depends on the state or the structure, but where those opportunities exist, it is, um, it does represent the, the chance to capture part of those profitable businesses that serve patients in related ways. And so I'd say all of those are opportunities worth vetting for, um, physicians looking at different options for uh, employment. Thanks, Justin. We're kind of winding down on the episode now. You mentioned uh, tax purposes uh, for um, W-2 versus 1099 uh, for medical legal. Any other uh, advice for physicians to reduce their taxes? Yeah. So whenever you have 1099 income from whatever source, uh, it opens up not only the solo 401k, which is great, you also have deductibility of expenses. So the mileage that you drive, home office deduction, any tech product or hardware, software, tech subscription, um, different services that you utilize, different professionals that you hire, any of these expenses to the extent that they're used in the production of your self-employment income are tax deductible. So you essentially pay for them pre-tax. So you basically take the sticker price and multiply it by (laughs) 0.6. That's kind of the effective rate that you're paying for those services once you account for the tax benefit. So having that self-employment income can create more tax benefit opportunity than you have if if you're just a W-2 employee. If you're a practice owner and you're a decision maker within an organization, there's many, many, many (laughs) tax opportunities to give you just a couple simple ones. Um, Understanding the basics of retirement plans. So a 401k would be sort of the the first foundational um, pre-tax contribution type that a practice owner would institute. In many cases, especially if the physician is a little bit further in their career, a cash balance plan or cash balance pension plan can be a supplement to that that can increase the capacity for pre-tax savings significantly. This doesn't work as well for younger doctors because it's based on actuarial tables. And if you're younger, especially if you have older employees, uh, it it skews the contribution ratios such that it gets to be really expensive to run a cash balance plan. But for physicians who are moving towards um, eventually, you know, bringing out a partner and selling their practice and getting out of clinical medicine, eventually beginning to think about a cash balance plan can be a way to sort of put a cherry on top in terms of pre-tax savings down the line. And then a couple other strategies that some of my clients and friends talk about and use. One is called the Augusta rule. This is kind of a fun one. So there's the Augusta country club in Georgia. And there was this, uh, essentially carve out that shows you how much Tax policy is just a product of being in the good old boys club, but it's called the Augusta rule because every year, uh, some of the folks around the Augusta country club leave town for a couple of weeks. They rent out their house while they're gone. And there's this carve out that if you rent out your primary residence for two weeks or less, the rental income derived from that activity is tax free. So one of the ways that a business owner could use this is you hold periodic staff or board meetings at your house you rent your house back to the entity of your medical practice and you, uh, for whatever the market rate is. And this requires a lot of documentation. You can't just start doing this, talk to your CPA. And this is not tax advice either because I'm not a CPA. (laughs) So this is where I mentioned building a professional team. You want people who can advise you on this. But, you know, if you live in a pretty nice house in a pretty nice neighborhood, how much does it cost to rent a similar house for one night on Airbnb? You take that, you multiply it by 14, And as long as you have appropriate documentation, that is the amount of pre-tax income that you can migrate from. I was going to pay 40% or 45% taxes on this to I'm paying 0% taxes on that. 
If it's a thousand or two a night, if it's a really nice house, that's we're talking real money at some point. And then the final one I'll mention, this is great for physicians who have kids, especially if they're in the preteen teen years. There's a number of benefits to employing your children. Uh, the primary benefit is you can teach them about how to work. <laughs> and uh, it's tough. There's actually, let me actually take this opportunity. There's a great book. It's called The Opposite of Spoiled. So for anybody who's listening, who's like, I've got kids, we make money, and I'm worried that they are going to be silver spoon children. Check this out. It's by Ron Lieber, who's a uh, New York Times personal finance columnist, The Opposite of Spoiled. And it's just about how to like raise your kids with a sense of the value of a dollar and generosity, respect, hard work, all those things that we really value and that I have two young boys. I want them to be instilled with these qualities. But if you're a practice owner, you can pay your kids um, a market wage for their efforts. And if you pay them about $6,000 a year, this is how the math works out between 12 and 18. If you pay them $6,000 a year, they put that whole $6,000 in a Roth IRA or substantively all of it at age 65. And then they'd never contribute another penny into that Roth IRA. By the time they get to age 65, they've got a million dollars in a tax-free account without ever having invested another penny into that in the intervening years. So that's not exactly tax jujitsu. It's just paying your kids to teach them how to work and then letting the time value of money manifest over decades. But that's a pretty cool stat that after 40 years, your kids can be a millionaire, even if they literally don't do anything else. So if you're a business owner, it's definitely worth being aware of and taking advantage of some of these opportunities. Well, I got to get my six-year-old to start working now. <laughs> um, <laughs> that would, uh, any uh, further questions for Justin or closing thoughts as we wrap up this episode? No, I think it was really nice to kind of pivot from the you know heavy clinical conversations we've had in the previous podcast and just talk about some you know real everyday things that are just so important. And I think one thing that I was, you know, so stubborn about, you know, the first five or six years when I was out is that I don't need any help with this. You know, we, I'm, a, I'm a physician and I can Google all this stuff. At the end of the day, as you get so busy, is that, you know, I didn't know anything about like tax harvesting my losses and all these different things. And I think Justin brought about a lot of good steps. You just need a good team around you. And I finally bit the bullet, you know, maybe five or six years ago. And I'm kicking myself for not getting someone like Justin on my team way earlier because, you know, probably, um, I probably lost a lot of money. That's kind of painful to think about right now, but better later than never. So Justin, thanks for all that advice. And we look forward to you to continue to kind of help our, uh, folks, uh, folks out with all these great, great tips. And I, I also, am going to make my three daughters start working now with that, uh, millionaire nugget there. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Justin, for joining us. We'll give you the last word and also where physicians can find you. Yeah. So my website is apm-wealth.com. Uh, if you want to just email me, you can. It's justin at apm-wealth. I uh, would love to hear from any listeners, even if it's just like brainstorming or I've got a question or I'm thinking about two different practice opportunities and trying to figure out which is a better fit. For the listeners of this audience, I'm happy to just have that conversation and we can kick around ideas and, and see what happens. And for anybody interested in engaging formally, we can explore that as well if it's a fit. But I'm really just interested in continuing to provide as much value as possible to this Aspen community. It's been really a pleasure to be a part of these last few years. Thank you both, Justin and Dawood, for, for joining us. Uh, this wraps up episode six of the Pain Unfiltered podcast. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for listening to the Pain Unfiltered podcast with your hosts, Dr. Patrick Buchanan and Dr. Timothy Deer. Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review if you enjoyed this episode.